And once again, welcome on board Delta with service to Jacksonville. My name is Janice, one of your flight attendants in the forward cabin on today's flight. Working with me and you in the cabin is Laura. It is our pleasure to serve as your flight attendants on today's flight. We are excited to have you on board today and appreciate the opportunity. When Philip was returned to Florida to face justice, Patricia laid a wreath at the spot at the Oak Harbor boat ramp where Josh was killed. After nearly 20 years, so much had changed since that night in August. The lead detective, Jim Davis, died in 2011, aged 50. The case was on its seventh assistant state attorney. One of them, Angela Corey, had been fired, won election, gained global notoriety, and lost election. Another state attorney, Mark Borello, became a judge. There had been seven home secretaries in the UK between when Philip was arrested and his extradition. One became and quit as Prime Minister. Two were anointed to the House of Lords. James Eady QC represented the UK at the European Court of Human Rights to extradite Philip. He was knighted less than a year after Philip was returned to Florida. The other men and boys at the boat ramp went into prison, came out of prison, and went into prison again. And still, Patricia went to the boat ramp, waiting for somebody to be jailed for killing her son. This is the story of how the murder of Joshua Hayes in Florida led to a killing in Scotland, to one of the longest extradition battles in British legal history, and how one mother saw it to the end beyond anyone's expectations. Chapter 9 The Table My name is Tristan Stuart Robertson, and I'm a reporter based in Scotland. And I've been listening to Josh's mom, Patricia, for more than a decade. Sunlight filters through palm trees and a slight haze in the brisk December wind under blue skies on a visit to the boat ramp. Patricia goes to the site when she needs to get away, or on the anniversary of the murder, or Father's Day, or Josh's birthday. It's deceptive how expansive the waterways are from this modest concrete ramp. There's a picnic table. A sign with the park rules looms large and shows its age. Patricia says it's been the same since before the murder. There are contrasts at the site. The vastness of the water and grasses to the north and west, and the relative compactness of the car park and nearby properties. Patricia stands on the concrete ledge, looking down and out over the waterway. She's seen a manatee once or twice down there. Josh used to set out in his canoe from the ramp, He would take girlfriend Tracy and Josh Jr. all the way to Jacksonville Landing in the city's downtown. Patricia knows the exact spot where Josh died. It's covered by a boat trailer the day we visit. The tree several yards away that Patricia said the bullet went through 
has grown around its wound. The geography of Mayport and the beaches holds memory of childhood, family, and loss. The city of Jacksonville is spread out across hundreds of square miles, but this was a neighborhood crime. There's Philip's former home, and Josh's. There's where he played. Here's where he died. The trailer park where Josh and Corey used to live is now a new housing development. We tour past where Patricia and Robert used to live for 10 or 11 years until she had to get away. Her minivan has a front license plate with My Guardian Angel and Josh's face on it. His dates of birth and death are on a sticker on the rear windscreen. His face, the picture without the glasses, is on pendants hanging from the rear view mirror and on the keychain. She got a new headstone for Josh's resting place in Mississippi, and she brought the old one home to Florida and put it under a tree at the side of the house. The yard is filled with the smell of chainsaw fumes and cut trees as surgeons take down some maple, sycamore, and pine on her property to let in more light. The pool is covered to keep the dogs out. Patricia's home is adorned with dedications to family and love on any spare wall space. Above doorways, above country rustic kitchen cupboards. Just inside the back door off a seating area, an entire living room wall is lined with shelves dedicated to family. The different units focus on relatives who have passed on and the children and grandchildren still living. Patricia's husband, Robert, bought Yankee candles dedicated to the relatives, complete with photos and years of birth and death. There's one for Josh. There's a large portrait of Josh and his grandfather, Clyde, fishing, smiling. On a wood and glass-topped half-moon table is a painting of a crown, a giant heart inside it. Number one mom, it says across it. And the first initials of the five children at the top of each jeweled spire. Josh, Corey, Joseph, Timothy, and daughter Elizabeth. I'm going to start uh, listening. Like, it's been hard. I mean, I'm the person that she calls when she's upset. A lot of times you can just sit there and listen to her because what feedback are you going to give her? A lot of times when she's talking about it, it's like she just wants somebody to listen. You know, we'll talk about like, not really the case, but just different things. When she's talking about the case, it's more or less like she's trying to get it off her chest. Because it's more or less like I listen. If it's talking about the case, then it's okay. Well, why don't you ask this? Why don't you find out about this? But normally it was just, you know, sitting and listening to her. It's just hard for me to talk about it. I have to stay strong for her. Patricia got Josh's glasses back from the state relatively early. They remain in a paper bag, one of the few items in the large trunk she can't and won't look at. Everything Josh touched, anything with his signature, is still kept in that trunk. It is topped with pictures, candles, a single rose Josh gave his mom 
after a visit to the dentist when he was in high school. The chest sits inset to the bay window with more framed photos of Josh, including the ones used on the t-shirts in 1999. There's a poem, Remember Me. A corner cabinet to the right has photos and memorabilia. On the opposite wall, there's another glass cabinet full of figurines, several of them angels. A two-tiered basket of candy and fun dips sits almost overflowing on the table. Patricia has put large brown paper bags next to it for our meeting. They're the evidence bags. Josh's clothing when he died. I mean, just everything my child ever touched. If it was uh, some paper that he signed his signature on, I've, I've kept all that. And I'll keep his case file. You know, I went through the other day and was reading through letters and cards and stuff that Josh had, you know, sent me because I wanted to, I wanted to get a tattoo, but I wanted in Josh's handwriting. And so I was going through his cards and I had come across one that said, you know, thanks mom for standing by me for all these years. Love Josh. That is the one I will get the tattoo of because I felt like that was past and present. That's just the way I feel in my heart and words meant to me. And that's the first time I had been in Josh's trunk because it is hard for me to, you know, go through his things. I mean, yeah, you know, I find a lot of pictures and little laughs and I found letters, you know, that he had wrote to Josh Jr. and with JJ. But that's the first time I'd been in that trunk in a long time. Philip was charged with first-degree murder and attempted robbery with a firearm or deadly weapon. When the case first started, Philip was frequently excused from having to attend court. But Patricia was at every hearing. With Philip back in Florida, he was back in a courtroom for first-degree murder. But he also sued his own lawyers. Backed initially by his mother, Kathleen, he filed a civil suit against the firm and its partners. He argued he should get back the thousands of dollars paid by Kathleen ahead of a potential return to face trial. That case was eventually thrown out when Philip went silent on the case for 10 months. Philip's new lawyer initially thought he had a strong case, and Philip wanted to take it to trial. He said lawyer Julie Schlacks told him, quote, the state has nothing. But she did want to depose Leon Madden, Tony Randall, and Terry Glover. Her view was that the 2002 depositions of Leon and Tony cleared Philip. But Terry's deposition was, quote, damaging. But it had been a very long time since any of them had been forced to recall what happened. A few weeks later, there were fresh depositions of Tony and Leon. And both identified Philip as the shooter. They both insisted, under oath, they were not getting any special deals from prosecutors for their new evidence. Tony sketched a map of the car park at the boat ramp, showing the position of the two cars. His 2017 sketch matched Terry's from 15 years earlier. But they couldn't find Terry. The teenager who drove Philip to the scene. The teenager who turned on Philip and was the foundation for the case. The teenager who was given a sweet deal by prosecutors for probation only. Probation he broke. Philip's lawyer couldn't find him. 
when both she and the state attorney's office tried to bring Terry in for a new deposition, he refused. He threatened to, quote, bury Philip. In the midst of that, Philip's lawyer made two more attempts to discharge the case over the 175-day speedy trial limit. And then, just as Terry was refusing to cooperate, Philip asked to meet with Patricia. They met at the state attorney's office with Philip's lawyer and assistant state attorney Dan Skinner. There was an agreement in advance that nothing would be used from that meeting. Philip claimed he had been in the worst prison in the UK and needed counseling for depression. Patricia said her son was locked up too, six feet underground. I just knew in my heart it was Philip. And that's one reason I fought so hard. I felt, well, if he's not guilty, why did he flee country? You know, why did he run from the police and they had to get the dogs on him? But then, like, you know, even meeting with him, he never took responsibility. I was to go in there and listen. But then we go in there, and, and even Skinner was saying, well, we're going to go in there, and he's going to say, well, it was one of the other guys. It wasn't him. And when we walk in there, and he come out and said, I was the one that shot Josh, but it was an accident. He said everybody played their part. And when I pulled the gun, Leon and um, Tony ran like, you know, it was a real robbery. He said Josh ran off and then ran back towards him. He said me and Josh got in a tussle with the gun. And I'm sitting here thinking, okay, you got in a tussle with a gun like this. He was shot point blank. So, you know, you're lying to me right off. He said, I stood over Josh with that stupid mask on. And I'm thinking to myself, I just grazed him. It's okay. He said, Terry come and put his hand on my shoulder and said, we got to get out of here. And he said, he told him, no, we, we got to check. I just think I grazed him. Terry said, we got to go before the police get here. He said, they got in the car. They drove to, over the Dams Point to the north side to wash the car. Because when they shot him, Josh is, went all over the car. He said, so... When we left the car wash, he said, we backed out. Terry said he needed a pack of cigarettes. I told, he said, I told Terry, take me back. He said, Terry looked at me and said, look, dude, he's dead. And he said, I told Terry, no, he's not. I grazed him. He said, then Terry took me and dropped me off. I did not know he was dead till the next morning. And I think he said it was Keisha come in and said, did y'all see the news? There was a body found at the boat dock last night. He said, that's when I knew that I had killed him. But it was an accident. I, I told him, I said, you know what? If, if it's within your conscience that you have to believe it was an accident, then you believe it. I said, because it was no accident. I said, on your decision, you took from me. And now why you can still see your family, I get to visit my son in a coffin, six foot under. He came on saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, and I looked at um, Skinner, I said, it's over. I'm done with this meeting. Then we left out, and I looked at Skinner, and I said, so he finally, to all these years, he admitted to what he did. And Skinner said, yeah, but it was a decision that was made prior to this meeting that nothing in this room 
could be used against him. Okay. Why did I ever meet with him? If, if y'all knew this, what was the reason behind this meeting? So he could gloat my face again. He could laugh in my face again. He could lie to me into my face again. Basically, that's what, what y'all set me up for. And he said, well, we were hoping that maybe when they had took him back over to his cell, if he would have said something to the detective or whatever, then we could have used that. But anything that was said inside this room, we can't use against him. I was so pissed because you just put me through this. And him sitting there lying in my face, and I'm knowing he's lying, and you're telling me just to sit there and listen to what he's got to say. But in return, why? It's nothing that can, you know, I thought he finally admitted in. This was what we needed in this case. Patricia had been told prosecutors couldn't bring up the fact that Philip fled the country, just that he left the state. But that would also leave a potential jury with the question of why it took so long to prosecute. Was there not enough evidence? And Josh's character could be used against him. After that first meeting with Patricia and Philip, a plea was negotiated. Patricia wasn't happy with it and said she felt like she was railroaded. And you know, when I had to make that decision to, to as much as I hated it, and I felt like I was railroad, Josh was railroad, that I would have to take because I really didn't know what would come out in a trial. It was like, take this and it's guaranteed, or you take this and get nothing. On May 3rd, 2018, Philip Harkins appeared before Judge Linda McCallum in the towering Duval County Courthouse. He admitted his guilt to second-degree murder and attempted robbery armed with a firearm or deadly weapon. Prosecutor Dan Skinner told the court, quote, We have had many, many many hours of discussions over the years. They are in agreement with the sentence, and they are in agreement with the charges Mr. Harkins is pleading to. Philip was sworn in and asked if he understood what he was pleading to. He did. And did he give his attorney permission to negotiate the plea? He did. Was he satisfied with his legal representation? He was. Do you believe she thoroughly investigated the state's case against you and any defenses that you might have to the charges? Asked Judge McCallum. Yes. Has anyone forced you, threatened you, or coerced you to get you to enter this plea? No. Have they promised you anything other than what has been said on the record? No. Are you pleading guilty because you are guilty? Yes. The court confirmed he was not under the influence of any substances. He had no mental illnesses that would require medication, and he was not being deprived of medication and he confirmed he went to college and understood the blue form he was signing confirming the negotiated plea. And he confirmed he was giving up the right to a trial by jury for the state to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt, to call witnesses and cross-examine state witnesses, 
and the right to appeal any issues about the judgment. Judge McCallum checked if there was any DNA that could exonerate Philip. None was known to the state or defense. Sentencing was scheduled for May 17th. There were five people at the boat ramp on the night of August 10th, 1999. Josh is dead. Philip admitted murdering him. Tony Randall wasn't charged as an accessory. Neither was Leon Madden. Terry Glover spent years in and out of prison for breaking the probation deal done to secure his testimony. But he never had to testify. In Leon's case, in 2010, he got charged with home invasion. Of everyone at the boat ramp, Leon is the only one sentenced to life without parole. I have been unable to get in contact with Terry or Tony. Leon and Philip did not reply to my interview requests. In the wood-lined courtroom, there were only two victim impact statements read out in court when Philip was sentenced. A dozen members of Josh's family sat in the second or third row back in the courtroom. They were all in matching red tops, with the photo of Josh without his glasses on the front and angel wings on the back. The case took nearly 20 years to get to this point. This was the first time Josh Jr. saw his father's killer in person after seeing him on TV in Philip's first court hearing, not long after Dad's funeral. And Josh Jr. said he wanted to be there for his grandma. There is no recording of the victim impact statements read out at the sentencing. So I asked Patricia and son Joseph to read them for me. The family waited so many years for this moment. They deserve to be heard in full. Your Honor, we stand here before the courts to let you know what an impact this has had on our lives. There are no words to describe what myself and my family has been through by losing our loved one. Josh was a good son, a loving father, and a big brother. He loved the outdoors, going fishing with the son and family, and hunting with the son. It was very special to him to spend family time on the holidays during special events and to make very special memories. On August 10th, 1999, all that changed. There will be no more happy holidays or family events spent with Josh. Not only did I lose my son, but also a father was lost to my grandson, which changed his life forever, and a brother was lost to his siblings. There was also a loss of a future grandfather as his son's children would never know him. Our lives have not been the same since we lost Josh. On August the 10th, 1999, my son was given a death sentence, and we were given a life sentence of on and off again sorrow. I have been under doctor's care ever since this had happened. I have fought for nearly 19 years for justice for Josh and our family. There will never be closure losing my son. Cost me a part of my heart and soul. Life has not been the same and never will be. I have had to watch my grandson live his life battling depression, yet trying to move on. On December 25th, 1976, I was blessed by God with a very special Christmas gift. Josh was born into my hands, into my world. I have lost that blessing now, and I am only left with special memories due to the fact another human being took his life. I will never hear my son's voice again, see his beautiful smile, make special memories, tell him how much I love him, or hear him tell me, I love you, Mom. 
I was blessed with Josh on a special day, and now he is my angel. There is no man on the face of this earth who had the right to take him away from us. My name is Joseph. I am the middle child of Patricia Gallagher, of which Josh was the oldest. I was 16 years old when he was taken from our family. At that age, I was still a teenager, and I had a lot of growing up to do. On the second week of August, Josh and I had a blowout argument, which I was the cause. It was over something stupid, and it ruined our family day. A day when my mother had all of her children together for once. It was a day for her, and I didn't see that. I ruined it that day. We all rode with mom to get family pictures. It was a quiet ride, except for the occasional sniffles of my mother. Upon glancing over at her, I saw her face in waterfall of tears flowing from her face, creating large wet spots on her shirt. After we ate and finished with the pictures, Josh was dropped off at his place and we went home. After reaching the house, we all went about our business not saying anything to each other. Corey left shortly after we arrived, as did Elizabeth. Timmy went to his room, and Patricia went to her usual spot on the couch. It was quiet the rest of the night. Several days went by, and we haven't heard from Josh. Finally, on August 10th, Josh stopped by my mother's house specifically to speak with me. He wanted to go to Golden Corral and have dinner and talk because he hated that we weren't talking and wanted to work it out. I acted like a spoiled child again and refused and blew him off with a loud voice and obscenities as I stormed off to the bedroom. Two hours later, Tim and I were in our beds, me on the top and he on the bottom. After a few hours of being unable to fall asleep, we began to converse about the unease we were feeling. My skin burned as if it was a bad sunburn and somebody touched it. Moments later, we hear the front door open and close repeatedly. A little commotion, and then Mama entered the room hysterically and told us Corey had something to tell us. He's dead. He's dead, Corey said frantically, referring to my brother Josh. Words that will haunt me to this day. It's been 19 years and I still have nightmares of that night. Those words and the facts that I never got to say, it's my fault. I'm sorry. The heaviest weight I have ever had to carry physically was my brother's casket. Emotionally, it was and still is having to watch my mother and nephew keep their composure, hiding their pain on a daily basis, especially on holidays and family events. Finally, mentally, living with the fact that I never owned up and said I was sorry, which plagues me daily. I have since had three children who will grow up and never know their Uncle Josh except through pictures. I've gone to counseling and taken medications, but still the nightmares are the same. I thought that the end of this whole ordeal would ease my pain as well as the rest of the family and provide me with closure, but the cold hard truth is that I have to live with this pain for the rest of my life. Philip Harkins was sentenced to 25 years in state prison for murder. He got 15 years for the attempted robbery, but that was to run simultaneous to the murder time. And he got 15 years credit as part of the deal. On the murder, he was given credit for time served, 5,631 days. His time on remand in 1999 in Florida, and the time since he was arrested for killing Gene O'Neill, in Scotland. For Patricia, that was a hard deal to swallow. She always believed Philip had more rights than they did. She fought for years on the assumption he could potentially serve life without parole. Now he would be out 
in only a few years. She believed Philip should be serving 40 years for the charges, back to back. Okay, number one, why do I have to give him credit? He fled this country on his own free will. He went to another country. He committed another crime, which picked him up. And now you're telling me I've got to give him the five years back that he served for taking another life, plus the time he sat over there, which he could have stopped that time at any given time and quit filing appeals and came back and faced justice. So why should the time he spent in another country have to do with this one? Because he fled on his own. Patricia had asked Josh Jr. if he wanted to go to the sentencing. He had never seen his dad's killer in person, and she was worried about what it might do to his mental health. The murder took such a toll on him, and even with everything Patricia had been through, she didn't know if Josh Jr. should see Philip. Josh Jr. said he had to go. For his dad. To see the man who changed his life forever. Which I, and I told him prior to it, he didn't, he didn't have to go. It was an forceful thing. It's something that he needed to search his soul to know if he wanted to be there to see the guy's sentence or if he just wanted it to be, you know, stay away from it. And he said, Grandma, I'm going to go for you. He told Patricia, quote, Grandma, we got something for Dad. Patricia requested her own meeting with Philip, something agreed as part of the plea deal. She went through the trunk before meeting Philip the second time. She sat on the floor going through the cards and letters from son to mother, reminiscing about the past and a life lost. There were albums of photos, the pictures she took of the family at the crime scene weeks after the murder, blood stains still visible on the asphalt. She pulled out one photo in particular. She doesn't even remember the reason she took it all those years ago. Patricia and Elizabeth went through the halls towards a small interview room in the state attorney's office building next to the courthouse. She sat with her back to the door, Elizabeth on her left. Philip sat at the far end of the wooden table with his lawyer. Assistant State Attorney Dan Skinner and a victim's advocate were at the sides. Patricia said she brought something to show Philip. She slid across the photo of the six-year-old boy standing in front of the open coffin with his father inside. You see that picture right there? That was the last time I got to physically touch my child. You see that little boy standing there? That was the last time he got to physically touch his father before we had to give him his sentence to six foot under locked up in a casket in the vault for your decision. I said, so I just want you to see what you've done. I said, you know, and that's when I looked at him and I said, Philip, you told me I could tell you I hate you. It's beyond that. I hope you rot and burn in hell. Patricia said she told him that a couple times because she was so upset. Elizabeth was crying. Now with Patricia in the driver's seat, this was her turn. She didn't know if it affected him, 
and she didn't care. He looked at the picture, and then he looked at me and says, I'm sorry, Miss Gallagher. I said, you know what, Philip? Yes, you are sorry. And excuse my friends, I said, you're sorry as hell. I said, because you, you took my firstborn. You took my child. That was something that God put in my hand. That was my world that you took away from me. She referred back to the April meeting, where Philip said he thought about that night. He thinks about Josh. He thinks about that night. I said, well, I tell you what, why don't you think about him Christmas morning? And when I said, look what you've done to your own mother, he bowed his head to the table. I want to tell you it's over. I want to tell you that. It's not. First, a hold was put on Philip after he was sentenced. When he is released, he will be held by immigration and deported back to the UK. Here's a further example of the accessibility of Florida's judicial paperwork. You can look at anyone in prison, see their photos, descriptions of tattoos, their crimes, their expected release dates. In November 2018, Philip said he would write to the British consulate because he was told to get out of the dining hall before he finished eating. He said he, quote, routinely forfeit my food under like circumstances, causing me to lose weight. Shortly after he was jailed, Philip started the process of asking for a prisoner transfer back to the UK. He puts his date of arrest back to August 14th, not the 11th. He listed four children that he said he does not have contact with. An international prisoner transfer can only be agreed by the governor. No decision has been made as of the time of reporting this podcast. In the meantime, According to the Florida Department of Corrections, Philip has been working as a certified law clerk in jail. Though his brother Darnell declined to be interviewed, he insisted he and his mother would be returning to the UK when Philip was released. Philip's current release date is May 2026. And then, in June 2020, Two years after he pleaded guilty, Philip appealed to undo the whole thing. He filed a 56-page motion for post-conviction relief to set aside the conviction and sentence. Philip argued his lawyer hadn't told him he could appeal again on the 175-day speedy trial issue, one that was repeatedly thrown out of court over 20 years. Julie Schlax declined to represent Philip again. So did his first defense lawyer. He also claimed Tony and Leon made secret deals with prosecutor Dan Skinner for relief on their sentences in exchange for new depositions pointing to Philip. Supposedly, Tony had contacted a friend of Philip's to apologize for what he did to Philip. In fact, Tony's probation was ended early after an application by the state attorney's office, and they have appealed to reduce Leon's sentence from life without parole. Hearings kept getting put off during COVID. Because of his deficient defense lawyer, Philip claimed his guilty plea was involuntary. He said Tony, Terry, or Leon all could have killed Josh. The state eventually replied and pointed out Philip pleaded guilty, and his accusations about deals with others were speculative. Philip said he should have a right to refute that response. 
a court set a hearing on just one aspect of Philip's appeal, that prosecutors allegedly withheld information, that they had made deals with Tony and or Leon. And just days before that hearing, in March 2023, Philip voluntarily gave up his appeal. So, after almost three years, he stuck with his guilty plea, after all. And a month after that, Philip said in a court filing that he planned to ask the governor for executive clemency. The very thing he and his lawyers spent years in the UK and Europe arguing almost never happens. So the murder case remains listed as reopened in the court system. And while it has, Philip had another change in his life. He got engaged again. So often, the image of justice is either a gavel or a set of scales. A gavel implies final, bang, done. Here ends the case. Here ends the story. Here ends justice. Scales suggest a balancing act between accuser and accused. Of rights on all sides with a static and detached arm sitting as anchor between the two sides. It is neither. When artist Jason Skinner made the logo for this podcast, I realized that justice is a complex system of pulleys. They yank and lurch and creak under the demands of accused, of victims, of lawyers, of judges, of politicians, of rules, of rights, of emotion. Nobody will serve a life for the life lost on August 10th, 1999. Philip killed two people on two different continents. He tied up two legal systems in knots just as they were designed. He made appeals himself or let landlords and former partners file lawsuits against him over their children. And Philip and his legal questions kept the case going for nearly 20 years. Those connected with the cases have been knighted, elevated to the House of Lords, won and lost elections, become prime ministers there will be no punishment for Philip leaving Florida. Remember, authorities agreed not to prosecute him for that. But the consequences were extreme. Gene O'Neill died. It took 14 years to get him back, and the combined efforts of multiple governments, agencies, and courts covering hundreds of millions of people. And by 2026, Philip could be back in the UK. And he can drive again. And the murder of Joshua Hayes was just one of 83 in the city of Jacksonville that year. Chino Neal was one of more than 3,500 road fatalities in the UK in 2003. For those left behind, there will always be a loss. For Josh's family, it is a murder without end. I phoned Patricia about a week after the sentencing. She told me about the meeting, the photograph, the raw anger, the frustration at Philip and the state attorney's office this near-twenty-year tug-of-war inside her 
to see justice was done? I, I know this is a, a difficult question to ask, but I am I'm sure you pray every day and, and that you would speak to, to Josh in, in your prayers. Do you remember what you said in your head or out loud to Josh after that sentencing, after that meeting? Yeah, I told him, I hope you know I did all I could do, son. I fought it with everything I had. And that was when we come out of the courtroom. And I looked to Jay, and I told him, I said, I hope your dad knows we fought with everything we had to get us this far. And I hope the decision I made to take this plea was the right one. But I really feel that Josh knows I fought with everything I had to get what we got. Jay looked at me. He said, Grandma, Dad would be so proud of you because you did fight so hard. I could not just sit back and let Philip just, you know, go back to Scotland and live a life and just let it be. I fought really hard with the state down here. I mean, I was probably their worst enemy, but I wasn't going to give up. And I wouldn't have gave up to my last breath. But like I said, I even walking out of that courtroom, I didn't feel like I got justice for my son. Because I still know that one day, Philip is going to be a free man. I'm not saying I'm not glad I got what I got, because anything was better than nothing. The fact to know that one day, he'll be back in Scotland living his life. My son has no more life. I beg and cry for Josh to come visit me in my dreams. To hear his, It's like the few times he visited me, I could hear his laughter, but I couldn't see his face. But I could hear him laughing and talking, but I couldn't see his face. And I don't know it's because it's something I blocked out because of the last, you know, time when I had to identify his body in the body bag and see him laying in his coffin. If my mind has just blocked it out to remember the smile in Josh the night that me and him was playing around in that yard. Patricia always taught her family to say I love you, regardless of what was going on. It's a point she said to me in almost every interview. She and Josh said it the last time they saw each other. They were playing around in her yard. Josh asked her to make him dinner. He knew she hated to cook. Patricia said they tussled and chased each other, something she does with all her children. Patricia said they always thought they were stronger than mom.
A Murder Without End, was reported and edited by Tristan Sir Robertson. It was produced by Liam Pollock. Dylan Anthony wrote the exceptional music. Jason Skinner designed the amazing art. Additional thanks to Maxine MacArthur, Rebecca Day, Carl Vaughn, Carrie McClure, Kate Hollins, Tempany Grace, Pippa Smith, Sarah Gonzalez, and the journalism students of Peyto High School, Julia Wright, David Gracie, Bear Radio, Aaron McGuire, Pamela Koloff, Lane de Gregory, Maria Carrillo, and the Right Lane Podcast, Lee Perlman, Maggie Rar, Andrew Dean, Michael Stewart, and many more who have listened to me talk about this story for so many years. And finally, to the family of Joshua Hayes. There is no journalism without those willing to speak to us. And it was Patricia's openness and that of her family that helped expose this story to the light. Finally, after two decades. <laughs>